And so I think I pressed space bar. Alright, fantastic. So um, so 20 questions, why, why I start with 20 questions? Well, when people ask me, you know, Evan, what do you, what do you work on for research? Um, it's kind of the most thing that I say doesn't make sense, and the thing that makes the most sense right away to any person is that I work on playing 20 questions. Or like asking questions, I think it's appropriate. Uh, we started the talk by uh, playing a game of 20 questions, right? So, um, have you all played, can, can you raise hand if you played 20 questions? So it's like, most of you, so just to uh, change the rule real quick, so I think there were secret items, and then, uh, like for example, an animal of some sorts, and then you ask me a whole bunch of yes-no questions trying to figure out uh, what the secret item is. So for example, if my secret item is a turtle, and you ask me, does it swim, and I will have to say yes. So you have to ask me more and more questions with the intention of figuring out um, what the hidden object is. And so we don't have enough time for like a full 20 question because that would take too long. So we're going to look at this uh, particular short game of 20 question where I can only think of one of these 12 uh, particular uh, animals. And uh, the question you can ask is in the column. So for example, can they swim or can they climb or is it, is it perhaps slow? And so my question to you is, what's a very good first question, right? So um, if I were to decide between the question, does it swim or does it fly? So can we have a race of hand? Who think swimming is a good first question? All right, so of course, we're, 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 our brains are too big, right? Um, so yes, of course, so the best first question is the one that kind of divides the total number of possible animals in very valid strategy. And uh, if you continue with this strategy, you can actually draw the whole game tree. Um, so you just go left. Um, if it fits the decision node, then you go right if it doesn't. Right? So I, I did this by hand, it took like an hour. Um, it's a very efficient strategy, right? As you can see, you could get the animal um, with just four questions, right? But this strategy has a very big flaw. And, and the problem is that if you kind of divide the remaining question, uh, uh, remaining item with yes or no, um, you have to count the items, right? So that's the, the bad part, is that what if you have too many animals, right? What if you're playing real 20 question where it's kind of like unbounded uh, number of objects and you wouldn't be able to count all of them, right? Or even if you could, that would take very, very long. And so, but human play 20 question just fine, right? So I think it's interesting to think about how, how human play 20 question. And so uh, let's consider Play 20 question by propagation, I'll give an example. Um, imagine we already established that we're thinking of an animal and the fact that it can breathe underwater. Okay? And then your friend Julio comes along and says, does it have feathers? Um, so is this a good question? Well, kind of not, right? Because you know, if an animal can, can breathe underwater, it's probably like a fish or some worm or some, something. Um, but the thing that has feather tends to be bird, right? So clearly, it's a bad question. And so there's an intuition that we can, as human, we can decide if a query is bad um, by just kind of relating the past observation to this future query, right? It's kind of like saying, well, condition on the fact that we know it can breathe underwater, there's no way having feather is a good second question. So there's some kind of knowledge that we as humans have that can help us decide if a query is good without actually counting or enumerating over um, all the possible animals. And so that's really the um, intuition of the thesis is that uh, we want to do informative querying with not by counting or thinking over you know, the latent hypothesis space, we want to do so by just propagating some observations to some other observations, right? So I'm just going to read the slides for now. So um, the ability to propagate uh, past observation to future observation is very important in making fast informative queries, so kind of like a human play 20 question. And then, but the ability to do these kind of propagation, you cannot get this ability out of a vacuum, right? Like we can do this propagation because we have a lot of prior knowledge of how these observations relate to each other, right? You don't get this for free. And so this thesis is kind of an adventure in trying to use some kind of meta-learning to learn these kind of propagation reasoning of how observation relates to each other and kind of twisting these querying problem into be able to be solved by propagation. So in some, some sense, this is what the thesis uh, is about. All right, so we're going to do an outline um, and kind of a question style. So we just gave, we need to give an intuition, kind of formally define what is propagation and why, why, why we use it, why, why does it have some advantages over some other approaches. 
And then right away, I'm going to tell you the applications we can already solve. And they're, I think they're a pretty cool application we can solve with using propagation in the context of making formative period. And then we're going to do some related work, right? Because I'm sure many of you are already asking, wait, isn't people already doing this with active learning or active diagnostic? Isn't this already existing work that people already export? Um, and then I'm going to discover, uh, not discover, discuss um, how do we get propagation, right? So we, I tell you the propagation we learned by mental learning, but like how do you actually perform the process of mental learning? So I'll show you how to do that. And then we'll do some proofs of saying, um, you know, you could actually twist these kind of curing problem into the form that it could be readily addressed by propagation. So this is kind of how do you actually uh, justify applying propagation to the problem that we said we could do. And then with some empirical results that, you know, does it be some actual strong baseline in practice when we actually implement it around it in terms of like um, number of period made and or in time of compute time and such. Okay. And so I think this is the most important one is like what is propagation and, and why why we use it, right? So um, so first of all, propagation is a function, okay? It's a function that map past observation to future observation. And so I need to define to you uh, what is an observation. So an observation is kind of a purity outcome pair. So in here, the x are the purity, and the y is an outcome. So when we say past observation, that means it's a full pair. I have both the query and the outcome already observed. When I say future observation, I just mean the query without the outcome, because we don't really know. So we can say either query or future observation kind of interchangeably. And so, um, so the goal of propagation is taking these past observations and try to predict the outcome of the future uh, observation. So that's actually the functional form of propagation, right? So you take some past observations and someone hands you a future query x, and then you as a propagator you have to answer the question, well, what's my belief over the outcome of this new, new query x? So that's the functional form. Okay? Um, so we are not the first people to address these problems, right? There's like many, many prior work that actually do model this particular form of computation of propagation. But I want to emphasize that well, they all follow uh, kind of a, this particular form. So how might one kind of do this problem if I were just to hand it to you someone? Say, can, can, can you do propagation for me? Um, well, the first step, they can say, well, take my past observation, can fit a model, right? I can do SciPy import model decision tree, blah, fit, right? Um, and once I fit the model, I get the function f, and then on the future observation, I can simply apply the model. I could say like f dot execute or something on a new thing, right? And most prior approach does uh, follow this um, kind of paradigm. And here, you know, um, for simplicity, I assume you can fit a single model. So, um, but in the talk, the rest of the talk, we're gonna take a Bayesian view so you can fit like a distribution of model. But for now, for simplicity, let's mention as a simple um, single model. Um, so, in kind of hand wavy philosophical land, what's actually going on is you're performing an induction step that take observation and you kind of perform induction to come up with a hypothesis and in future prediction you're applying deduction, right? Which is to say I'm going to apply my hypothesis F on the new purity uh, test. Are we all good with that? So this is kind of like a, like a jump, right? So to go uh, to the future observation, these prior approaches tend to go up into some latent hypothesis land and then come back down by deduction. And that's a lot of work, right? We want to go across. We want to do transduction. So transduction is a super cool word. It's this like Vladimir Vepnik, the, the VC that mentioned that he really liked transduction. And I think we should look at transduction or it's a really cool process. It's kind of saying um, instead of going up and down, we just go sideways directly. And but you know, they, they compute the same thing, right? So I'm not arguing that I'm computing something novel. I'm arguing that, you know, whatever this thesis compute in terms of propagation, people can already compute. But by formulating it as a direct transduction, the learning aspect become much easier. So I'll give you examples. So why do we use propagation? Well, it's easier to latch onto a very simple pattern with a transduction model. And that's kind of the key takeaway, right? So let's perform a very simple transduction task. I know 4 goes to 5. What does 4 goes to? It goes to 5, right? So like, do you need to do any induction to do that? I don't think so, right? Like, you don't 
very simple. And then, um, of course, the um, you know, propagation is a neural network that's you nowhere know, 2019. Uh, I'll tell you how we get it with meta learning very, very soon. But for, for now, let's imagine we have our hands on good propagation that can do propagation. And I'll tell you how to get it later. Okay, so now let's do uh, application. How do, we, how do we use this propagation? I imagine we, you know, God just throw the propagator down. We're like, oh, fantastic, right? How, how do we use it? And so we're going to look at some applications. So um, the first one to look at is, you know, preference elicitation. It's a very cute uh, problem that, um, that deal with sushi. So I'll just read the slide. So there are 10 kinds of sushi. And then a customer has a particular hidden preference of sushi. So he may like tuna best, and he might like shrimp. And then you're kind of like a customer service or like some kind of marketing person, right? You're, you're trying to figure out what the preference is by asking these pairwise stuff questions. You say, like, do you like yogurt or tuna? Do you like cucumber better than, I don't know, uh, uni or something, right? Um, and the customer response was yes or no, depending on his hidden preference, right? So everyone has a permutation that's hidden. So depending on the hidden permutation, I'm going to answer it. And so, um, let's see. Okay, so again, so the task is to you know figure out the customer's hidden preference list uh, as few questions as possible. Okay, great. So um, I'm gonna tell you, share with you a very cool way to visualize preference, which is with a 2D grid. Um, so imagine this is a some kind of preference, which is you know shrimp the best and you know fish egg the, the least, and then we can. Lay this over on a 2D grid by just saying all pairwise comparisons, right? So, for example, uh, here we know that uh, squid is more desirable than tuna, right? So, if you look at the little uh, dot floating around, so the on the row it's in squid, and then on the column I think is tuna, right? So, it's saying that that particular white pixel represents you like uh, squid more than tuna, and so this is a um, let's see what I want to say. This is an infinity. So like there will be some 2D grid configuration that's inconsistent ordering, right? So there's more information in 2D grid, but this is nonetheless a very good way of representing uh, 2D ordering. Um, because why? Because you can see the very cool structures about ordering. There's anti-symmetry, right? If something show up in a row column, it does not show up in the column row. And it also has transitivity, which is to say, um, if you like shrimp more than eel, and if you like eel more than squid, in the picture you could just kind of take these like Bit of intersection in the upper right corner, and you, you should get something that's uh, built on transitivity as well. Okay, so now we're going to talk about how to perform uh, preference solicitation with with propagation, right? So this is a uh, propagated result from a neural network, and I'm going to explain what the uh, what the color scheme is. So the green is a observed query, right? So a green dot means the customer already tell you, yes, I prefer this row item more than this column item. And red is opposite, like I do not prefer this. And um, so now I need to talk about the rest of the cell. So if the cell is very bright, the neural network is propagating to this future potential question, I really think that's true. And the more dim one, the neural network thing, I really think is not true. So for example, um, let's see if the mouse works here. Can you see the mouse? Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So as you can see, there's already a little bit of cool um, anti-symmetry structure being learned here, right? So like, he knows that um, this tuna is not preferable to squid, and the neural network is able to hallucinate that. Oh, by the way, the opposite should be true. So they, they kind of learned how to propagate some of these um, structures about ordering, which I think is very cool. Um, so the question is, um, and gray is not sure, so the question to you is, given this is the result of the propagation, how do we use this propagation to select the next optimal query? So I think we have enough time to do another poll, like who think we should query the most bright query? Who think we should query the most gray query? All right, fantastic, right? so it's kind of obvious, right? You want to query the most uncertain one, and we can see this query in action action. So like this is actually the algorithm running the uh, preference solicitation and then it's crying the most great one. As you can see with actually about 20 questions also because mm -hmm. uh, log phase 2 of 10 factorial is roughly 20 something. I found it interesting. Uh, you can get the actual ordering back. So it, it's kind of how it would work with propagation to do preference elicitation. Okay. 
And so another application I want to talk about is to do representative subset uh, for program synthesis because you know, at the end of the day, I, I work for a model. Um, so, <laughs> um, so I have to say, in process, it's really cool. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> what does program synthesis do, right? It, uh, given a set of input-output examples, the program synthesis can recover your program that's consistent with these input-output. So think of it as like a symbolic regression. Um, but program synthesis, uh, these you know, existing approaches is very expensive. And they're expensive in the sense that they're kind of monotonic somewhat to the number of input-output examples. Because the more input-output you have, the more constraint formula you need to encode, and that incurs a very huge overhead. So what we wanted to do is select a small subset of input-output example, but the small set needs to be representative. So that's a tricky concept. So the idea of representative is to say, if my synthesis procedure recover a, a program over the small set, it has to be also consistent on the big set. So you're kind of like doing the real work with a lot less input. Okay, what's the next thing? Oh, yeah, cool. So this is an offset problem of, of preference solicitation and active learning, right? So in problem active learning, you're like, oh no, I don't have enough label. Here, you're kind of like, oh crap, I have too many examples, I'm dying. Active uh, learning you want 
quickly go over relays that work. And many of you might be thinking, oh, wait a second, this is some form of active learning or like some process selection or like some kind of Gaussian process. Um, so I'm just going to go through some of them. So uh, one classic relay to the work is active learning, right? So the goal is you want to separate the green dots from the, from the red dots. So the green is lower right and the red is upper left. And so the goal is to build this you know, decision boundary by you know, your data are not labeled. So how do you solve the problem? Well, um, you first make a decision boundary, and then you carry the point that's closest, which are kind of the most confusing one, right? because they're closest to decision boundary. So this is kind of these kind of boundary-based methods work for, for active learning. And then closely related is CGIS, right? So the CGIS, here the task is I can have some uh, green and red dots, and my hypothesis class is boxes, right? I want, I want boxes that the green things are inside and the red stuff is outside. And how do you, um, and the problem here is I have a lot of green and red dots, right? So this is more in, in line of representative subset. I want to only work over a subset of these green and red uh, dots. Okay, so the goal is to reduce the number of input-output examples. How do you do it? Well, we're going to select a few. Uh, so in the picture on the right, you can see some of the dots have this dark uh, boundary. Those are the ones we are currently selected. So we'll select a few, and then we will build a decision boundary over the one that we already selected. And how do we get the next one is we just pick a new example that contradicts it. So the green dots that's outside of the decision boundary is like, wait, wait a second, our box should have that dot, let's add it back in. So we can incrementally run the soft cycle with the pick contra-example cycle to build it, right? So this is why it's called, you know, contra-example guided inductive synthesis. So it's a pretty cool. Okay. And then also in terms of representative subset selection, so of course I'll just go over real quick. Um, you have a lot of points, um, but you know, they're maybe generated by some kind of process. Let's say it's piecewise linear, right? So rather than keeping all the points, we can you know keep the endpoints, and then I can throw away all the dots in the middle, right? So this is somehow structural uh, process selection. And last but not least, so everyone's favorite with like GP. Um, how does it work is that um, it's also a form of propagation, which is say based on the observation so far, I'm going to predict the outcome of future observation, right? So the observation here are just, you know, real numbers. You, you carry a real number and it gives you a real number. Um, so to go very quickly, uh, the goal is to optimize um, you know, this latent function, for example, and the solution is we have to make a GP assumption, which is any finite draws from this function is joined to be Gaussian. And then by making this assumption, we can do very cool inference. We can compute the posterior mean and variance of a future query. And then we are able to perform some kind of uh, algorithm, which is a upper confidence boundary synthesis. Okay. So, so the key distinction between this work of propagation with prior work is comes in kind of two flavors. So the prior work either um, assume a particular data generation process. So uh, these points are piecewise linear or they're joined to be Gaussian. Or what they do is to select a new period, they need to do the induction deduction step. They need to go up and down. So in active learning, you select a point close to decision boundary. Well, you need to get the decision boundary, right? So you need to solve the hypothesis. And you see this, you need to come up with a working program. So you need to solve. And so these two are the most different one. And the propagation is just a function that go from past observation to future observation. And it doesn't really assume any structural thing. The structural prior are learned in meta learning. And so, as a result, by making less assumptions about the underlying data generation process, we can be more informative than the approaches we dealt with, right? because these approaches assume a certain structure is not going to fit the data. So. And then, by being a function that goes directly across rather than up and down, it's going to be more faster than these other approaches that I Fantastic. All right, well, I need to end it here. All right, so I promised to you um, I'll discuss how to actually get the propagation function, so uh, we're just going to go into it. Um, so this is some kind of like a graphical model view of, of the propagation process. So um, I wrote some notes. This slide is kind of hard to go through. Let me see. The circle things are random variables. So the theta is somehow the um oracle that you need to interact with, like a hidden animal. And the 
the circle, another circle saying is y sub x, which is correspond to an uncertain future outcome. Right? And so uh, your query are axes, and these queries are not random. These queries are kind of like parameters. It's like, does it have feathers? It's kind of just like a single value. And as you can see, um, when I issue a query, because my uh, observation function, oracle function, is conditioned on some unknown prior of oracle, it becomes uncertain on the output, right? So I can ask the question, does it swim? But because my lack of knowledge of whether it's a turtle or a horse, uh, my output becomes a distribution, and so I need to do this. But you get some help, right? You're not going to make this you know, future prediction out of nothing. You also have context, which is uh, all the stuff on the left, which is on my past observation, which is to say, well, observe these x, i, and f to y, right? And then we have a stack of n of them. And so these past observations I'm going to denote with O bar. And when I say O bar, it makes past observation. And I think that's all I want to say. And so yeah, the propagation function um, approximate this particular probability distribution, which I call the propagation probability, which is I want the prediction of a particular curious outcome, y sub x, condition on the past observation. Right? So this is the actual form of propagation, which is from O bar to Y sub um, X. And this is actually a short pen, right? So if you kind of expand it out, what is O bar? Well, O bar is saying these um, oracle function F, uh, X, and theta, right? You can think of this almost as a random variable because, because theta is a random variable. So if I instrument my observation function f with theta, it also become a random variable. So this probability is actually saying, well, what's the probability of my oracle function to produce y on the future period x, conditioned on the fact that I observe the oracle function produce x1 into y1 and xn into y1. So this is kind of just the shorthand of the, the top. Okay. And let's imagine what would happen if we try to compute this probability directly. Um, well, this is what we want, and then you need to do integral, right? So this is kind of to be expected. So what's going on here is, you look at the right part, this is the induction step, if you will. This is saying, given my past observations, I'm going to compute a posterior of the space of all the possible hypotheses that's consistent. And on the left is the deduction step, if you will. So given a known hypothesis of theta, I can just run the new period x on theta and produce y. So as you can see, this is kind of the latent reason why you don't want to do induction and deduction because it, you need to integrate over the uncertainty on the, in the hypothesis space. So this is expensive. And what we want to do is we just want to approximate that directly with a propagation function. So we, neural network right, of course, it's going to come. Um, so we want to use some kind of universal function approximator uh, that approximates the propagation function. And I use a cube, which is a neural network, and you can structure it any way you want, um, but it's parameterized by these omega parameters that you can fit it. And so notice the form we're fitting to. We're fitting a conditional distribution, right? We're saying this is not out of a vacuum. It's saying given a particular future period x, given a particular past observation o bar, I need to predict the outcome of some future Right? So, do you want to model every possible conditions? Well, kind of no, right? Because if you're doing a querying test and you're only kind of imagine you can only go up to 10 queries, there's no point modeling this approximation to O bar that's larger than 10, right? Because that would just never show up. And so, and also these input query X sometimes might be just invalid or illegal to make condition on some O bar, right? So rather than kind of approximating P and Q over all possible conditions, uh, we kind of draw a single neural network and optimize the chaos divergences over some conditions on, uh, on some expected uh, future period and past observation. So this is just to say, uh, rather than building a different neural network per different uh, condition, we're only going to build a neural network that approximates kind of in expectation the likely query propagation scenario where likely to uh, run into during, during inference time. So we want to minimize this objective. Um, okay, so where is... Okay, so how do we 
minimizes. Notice they are minimizing some KL divergence over some sample of the expectation. So this sounds a lot like supervised learning. So in fact, our mental learning is supervised learning, so I'll explain to you how. Um, we want to sample X and O bar, but we don't want to sample O bar directly because if you just randomly sample X, Y pair, it, it might be inconsistent, right? The, no oracle is possible to map some X to some Y, right? That might just be inconsistent. So what do we do is we actually sample oracles. So we sample theta, and we sample a whole bunch of X. So the new period X and the past period X1 and X1. And what we do is we run all these queries through the oracle and the observations. So, and then we simply say, okay, these X1 to so Xn tie together with this Y1 and Y, and that's our past observation, right? And then this new query X is the new, it's a new query point, and then we just force the neural network to maximize the log likelihood of Y, right? So this is really standard supervised learning. You can see the sampling picture, kind of image, the propagation function picture, right? They're basically kind of the most direct encoding you can do. The real trick here is you don't want to sample a bar. You want to uh, take sampling all bar into two pieces, you sample the x and then you sample the theta, so that you don't run into the problem of creating inconsistent all bars. Okay, fantastic. Um, and so um, the title says propagator, so instead of propagation, so like what is a propagator? Well, a propagator is a propagation function together with the pass observation. I'll give you some advantages of reasoning this work in this way, right? You have some kind of economy here. Um, and it has nice properties because one of the nicest properties is complementary, which is to say that if you have a better propagating function, it can propagate a lot of information with just very few observations. But since we're using function approximation, it's likely that you know your propagation function is not perfect. This is where the O bar comes in, right? You can kind of make up for it. You can say, well, I don't propagate well, give me more support. So give me more O bar so I, I, I could propagate well. So these two parts are actually kind of complementary and it kind of degrades very gracefully. So like, in the beginning, your model might be absolute garbage on um, predicting the future, but as you collect more and more query, it becomes more and more confident because you can, at inference time, dynamic, dynamically grow the support set. And I think this property is super, super cool. Okay? And it's also fast for the reason already stated. And then this is kind of an interesting side note is that it, it allows for some query-specific attention, which is to say, um, the propagation function is given x. So you could say, well, given this particular x, I can look into my almost like a committee of past observation to say, well, maybe you guys can help me answer this question, and you guys I don't want to talk to. So you could, in fact, implement this queue as some kind of a, like attention network or like transformer, and this is all very, very interesting work. That that's very cool. Cool. Um, no, no, no. Um, <laughs> don't, don't, don't. <laughs> to 
to uh, compute for the future query the propagated result condition on the past query. And then we're going to do something with the output distribution of future query to select uh, the best example. Okay? And so now I'm just going to go over the two domains we discussed once for active diagnostic in the case of um, preference solicitation, but more in general, how to do active diagnostic and then do representation. So active diagnostic uh, with propagator, right? So the goal, the objective, is to infer the identity of the oracle, right? I want to recover the permutation. Um, and so what is a, just by looking at this, what is a good kind of ideal acquisition function, right? The ideal acquisition function is the one that maximizes mutual information between the new observation y sub x and the oracle theta, right? So this is kind of, if you can compute this, we should go with it. But you know the problem of computing mutual information is you're you know, you're, you're computing entropy things and you're taking, and so um, I want to go over prior work. So prior work kind of uh, mutual information has this symmetric decomposition. So you could say well the mutual information between theta and y is the entropy reduction of theta not knowing y compared with theta knowing y. So right so like you're more uncertain about theta if you don't know y, and then you're more certain about theta. You know why, and the reduction in your uncertainty is the mutual information between theta and y. And then, so the really cool thing about these prior work is that they make this very cool observation that you know the, the first term does not depend on x. So when you do an arc mean, the first term is a constant, so you kind of throw it out. So you just do like arc mean of the second term. Right? So what does this mean is we want to kind of minimize the uncertainty of theta by picking the best y. Right? So it's, if you think about hypothesis, But the issue really is you're taking entropy over hypothesis space, right? And if your hypothesis space is preferences, well, good luck, right? It's like factorial, right? You can't, you can't compute it. So with propagator, you can do this trick to say instead of taking the other symmetric uh, you know, decomposition, you, you do the other one, right? You could say, well, how about let's break it down the other way. We want to measure the entropy reduction over y instead of over theta, right? So this is just a um, trick. And then, really, the trick is realizing the second term is not zero. Because why? Because, you know, given the knowledge of your hypothesis, so I want to look at the second term, so I highlight this, this term here. Given the knowledge of your oracle, there's no uncertainty over outcome anymore, right? So, like, that's a really cool part, so it just poof, it, it vanished. And then, once you vanish, you get, oh, look at this, this is the entropy of future observation pass observation, a perfect well, run, run your neural network, I call it a script. And so this is how you do active diagnostic with propagator. Um, and so you do this, right? And the selection criteria is select the most uncertain query, which is the arc max of entropy. So this is kind of our intuition we have all along. But notice that this is only true if this term can be either zero or constant. So this is a non-trivial part of the proof. It's realizing that for this trick to work, you need some special condition on how the oracle relates to observation. So in here, we take the functional view, which is saying knowing the oracle observation is you know, it's, it's kind of single. And so I can go through. Right. So now I want to explain how to do subset selection as propagated. So uh, the goal here you know, is also infer the identity of the oracle, but the problem is I have too many things. Right. So, um, but what would be a very good way to collect uh, examples? Well, let me give you the ideal acquisition function. So here, um, I'm going to make an assumption to say the oracle, uh, the space of oracle is uniform, right? You're equally likely to sample one oracle over the other. And what we can do is we can construct this theta sub O bar, which is, um, you read in English, it's a consistent oracle with respect to O bar. So these are the set of functions that faithfully can be observed in the O bar fashion. It does map the x1 uh, to xn into y1 and yn over. So this is the consistent O bar. And so once you have this term defined, what we really wanted to do is to iteratively 
Great. Does it be strong baseline? I mean, like, yeah, it, it does. So, like, I, I, I don't like these results size too much because you can always, you know, torture it until it works the way you want it to work. But um, in terms of uh, solving the elicitation problem, we can beat sorting algorithm, which I find really cute. Uh, we're better than so these OC, uh, these two 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 lines on the top is our collection scheme uh, with propagator. And these are traditional sorting, like bubble sort, merge sort, and quick sort. So I think it's very cute that, you know, like sorting algorithm is actually active uh, in this equation. That's kind of really cool, it's preference. And so we can do better than sorting, why? Because we know about vegetarians, right? If you say, you know, you like cucumber most, or I'm not going to ask anything about cucumber, like cucumber is like this, because you're vegetarian. Right? And so this kind of says we can make more informative queries, and then here is really, we can do faster, so this is on the subset selection problem in the program synthesis example, where we draw these squares and lines. And so our results, in fact, beat all the other CGIS variants that you can do. And why is, the reason is clear, right? You don't go up and down, you go across, right? We, in each invocation of the CGIS algorithm, you involve a solve step, which is to say, given the current example, I'm going to run some SAS solver to give you the program. And we don't do any of that. We just query with the neural network. And once we're confident enough of the reconstruction, we just pass it to a solver once. So like, kind of a lot of the speed up is due to the fact that we only run the solver once in these approaches, and the, the, the prior work run them multiple times to select the example. And bonus is like, buy one, get one free. I, I almost didn't want to put it here, but it's really cool. I want to show you. Like, can you do Bayesian optimization? So like, I only did this for like the last month, but it's so cool that I wanted to share. Um, so how, how, what is basic optimization? Well, the goal is to find an expensive to evaluate function, uh, G. You want to find the maximum. You want to find out where the peak is. And you want to query it with, you know, blah, 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 as few, I mean, you guys know, right? Like, you want to get, get the top with few samples, right? And, uh, let's see. Uh, plot twist. This curve, I generated myself. Um, there's relationships in it. The left and the right are the same, except on the right I added some sign. So you see, if you can draw some sample on the left, you should be able to infer some uh, information on the right. Right. So I was hoping that you know, if you do Bayesian with a predefined kernel, it's not going to be able to like pick it up. And so some hard results. Uh, the maximum score is 0 0.5. Uh, our approach was, I think, I think 10 observations. We can get to 4.8 or 0. Point whatever, and then we're better than GPR, right? You, you get, um, I show you this cool animation. Of, so the left is GP with just I think it's just like the square exponential part that kind of goes away as time goes on, and the right is the one learned by a neural network, which is a, a a transformer. And the really cool thing is you can notice these parallel structures learned on the left and the right, right? Like it really picked up the correlation of what the curve looked like on the left with what the curve like looked like on the right. And to the, the acquisition function is just UCB, right? You select the most optimistic one. So like you select like for example here and now here and now oh okay, here and here and stuff like that. Great. Um, and that's, so in conclusion, um, don't go up and down. Go go across. Okay. Sometimes going across has very low fidelity, like you can't always go across something you cannot propagate. But um, the takeaway is, you know, uh, curing for information, he's like a, like a chill guy. He's not gonna kill you if you make some bad propagation. At the worst case, he, you cure it, he, he give it back to you, right? And now you become more certain. So like, you're working in this like very gentle, nice environment where you're not being penalized very harshly by your wrong prediction of future theory, right? Like you can kind of make better and better propagation by collecting more theory. And so really the takeaway is, you know, at least in the context of acquiring information and theory, you could afford to make these low level patterns propagation that are fast because the Oracle is, a, it, he's a cool guy. He just say, oh, well, that's a bad theory, but you know, condition your posterior on, on, on that thing I just gave you, and now you become more certain and become strong. Okay, and future directions, um, more amortized going across line of work. So one thing that is not going across is, for example, uh, the acquisition function needs to iterate over all the queries. What do you have a lot of queries, right? Like you kind of don't want to iterate over the queries. So maybe you want to build a policy that sample the query that's good. And then there's, uh, you know, Propagator is not going to solve all curing problems for you. There's a, still a very large class of curing problems that do require integration over the hypothesis uh, plane, which I really, really don't like because I don't want to integrate over the hypothesis. So I think there's a, some 
really interesting thing we can do to make sure that we don't interpret all the hypotheses, even, even in this case. But the thing I am personally most interested, I have no idea how to solve it, is design a good Turing function. 20 question is amazing because out of all the different objects you could think of, by just using a very good language to index into your head, I can get it with 20 questions. Imagine the question you're only allowed to ask, is it a turtle? No. Is it a penguin? No. Is it a bird? Like, that's a very poor language of communication in terms of query, right? And so what is a good app? It's, it's really cool, right? On, on the other hand, if you just divide the animal in half and dump it to the user, be like, is this just a no answer? And then you're like, oh, we have to come. That's also a bad function, right? So like designing the function that gives you the most information without being too difficult to answer. Like the cool thing about 20 questions is kind of in the design of this interaction scheme. It's like, has a very powerful observation function F that's like flexible and like have very low like cognitive load on the real human. And, and it's very cool and I think uh, it is just so exciting and I want to, I want to think about that. Great, and now the Oscar speech. Uh, <laughs> so first of all, I'd like to thank you for, for being here. Uh, thanks for coming to the party. I mean, it's a, it's a small crowd. I'm not the most famous researcher, but you know, uh, what's most important is you guys being here, and at least you guys know what I worked on for like seven years. Holy God. Uh, <laughs> uh, so that's great. And the next, I want to thank my co-authors because uh, you get the most information out of someone when they struggle, when they're most uncertain about something. And working with someone on the paper, really, it, it really grinds the crap out of them and you get to learn so much of their particular philosophies of dealing with problems, how they reason, how they handle all the other things. That they're just amazing people that have such a cool philosophical mind and like so wise and you, you really get that by working with them very intimately on, on the project that you both have some stake in. And I think co-authors by and by far helps the most in how to shape this thesis and how it comes up. And then research group, old picture, but you know, thanks for being here. Um, it's, it's hard to, you know, do work over a long time without going crazy if you're not in a good relation with your, you know, research group. And you guys have been so very gentle, and I like the coffee trains that we do, and I, I got a headache from coffee with straw, thanks. Uh, <laughs> but thank you, really, for, for the good, for good company, right? And I need to thank my committee. Uh, I, I have scripts for, for each one. Uh, Armando, thanks for being super chill and unconditionally support me with so much confidence, even though for four years I wasn't publishing any paper. And Armando would just be like, cool! And then, <laughs> and then that's really amazing, right? Because most people will freak out and Armando is super, super chill and that's, I think, rare. Um, and, and that's very amazing. I wouldn't have been able to do all these things if he just said, well, okay, you gotta publish paper on these things. And uh, it's chill. And then I'd like to thank Leslie for being um, very open about new ideas. I just kind of ran into her office, be like, oh my god, this idea, look. And then she was, you know, very nice, and, like she humored me, and then she was like, oh, okay, we can look at this. But she's also extremely strict, and the best lesson I learned from Leslie is you should not try to solve a problem that you haven't formally defined. So that's a singular lesson. You want to have a good description of a problem before having a prescription of how to solve it. So that I get from Leslie. Very cool. Um, and Josh, he, he just so cool. Um, he gave me appreciation of why human is like still the smartest thing and your computer is really dumb. Uh, and he gave me a deep appreciation of how to do live polls with the audience to keep them engaged. And Josh is such a such a such an entertainer and uh, if you haven't taken his class, I highly suggest. Uh, the, the entertainment value is just like off the chart. And um, Plus, you know, friend and family to my friends. Uh, let's cook a lot, play a whole bunch of video game, and like make some music, right? Sounds great. It's gonna eat like chicken McNuggets. Or it's gonna be awesome. <laughs> um, to my family, thanks for being so patient, especially my mom. Like, she really wanted to be like, Evan, you should get a job, and you're still making money. Look how you're curious. I mean, Johnny is only like 25, and he has a house and a car. <laughs> she really wants to say all that, but she stopped. She, she, she does
doesn't, right? Thank you. Thank you, family, for putting on this, my extended <laughs> educational history that takes too much time. And last, Twitch chat. Um, <laughs> thank you, Twitch, for watching a very weird stream of a guy writing programs on a new terminal. Awesome. <laughs> All right. And so now I'm ready for 20 questions. <laughs> Versus 
even thought about not uh, naming this in propagation, but naming a completion, which is kind of like filling the blank. Because the original training scheme is generate a whole bunch of observations and randomly accumulate a whole bunch of them happening filled back. And so your model training will work as long as you have observation. And this is like I don't have enough time to talk about this, but I do talk about this in the actual thesis document where these approaches will work even without knowing your uh, generative process. And that's frightening. You could do optimal curing as long as you think the underlying generating is a function. You could do curing without actually knowing how the function is. Like, that's kind of insane. Like, that, that kind of scares me. And I think it's very possible that you could do curing without inference. And that's, in fact, the, the key point of why representative subset selection works, right? You, you sample the thing that ultimately constrains the search space of your solver, but you do that agnostic to how the solver is being implemented, but by only observing how the you know, observation interacts with each other. And that's very powerful because, like Mongo said, in most real world scenarios, you don't have the generative process at your disposal, you only have observations. So what could you do? Well, I take observation, you ablate them, and then you train the propagator over the ablated data. And that will always work. You will always get something, and you will learn at least these simple patterns like x less than y implies y bigger than x. And so it's a great question. Oh, no, Zena.
Okay, cool. Thank you. I'm, I'm so glad you came. Right. Turn off the live broadcasting. Yep. <laughs> I'm out, guys. Take a good one. <laughs>